And it's uh, my honor to be here today with a couple of my colleagues from the Gulf Coast. Uh, a few months ago, Kevin Hilton had uh, suggested to me that instead of the normal owner panel that they have with uh, uh, different <clears throat> geographies and industries represented of people that have worked with IW in the past, it might be neat to have uh, some folks from the Gulf Coast come that aren't as familiar with IW and talk a little bit about how uh, chemical industry in the Gulf Coast does their business. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to have my colleagues, uh, Jim and Sharon, here with me today. Uh, in Jim's current role as the president of the Economic Alliance for the Houston Ship Channel region, I know that he's very well versed on uh, a lot of the construction and investment going on in our region and our state. Uh, so I'm going to kick off things a little bit. Why should we be interested in the Gulf Coast and have Jim talk a little bit about uh, what's going on down there? Sure. We've been having a lot of headlines lately. It seems like he can't read the paper in Houston without seeing a hundred million or billion dollar construction project being announced. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting times for us down there. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for this invitation. Uh, just to get to know the audience real quick, uh, quick show of hands, uh, someone that's been down Gulf Coast recently and seen some of the construction projects that we have active. One or two up there. Okay. Okay. Pretty small group. Okay. So let, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop uh, to our industry. Um, the, the petrochemical industry in East Harris County has 132 petrochemical plants and refiners. It's the largest of its kind um, in the country. It's, uh, I, I believe, the largest of its kind also in the world. And uh, in fact, we, we compare um, Harris County to states, and the economy is larger than 26 of our states. I believe if it was its own country, it would be about number 20 in the economic growth is, is substantial. Um, been in the industry, uh, I love this industry. Um, it's the industry that uh, I've been in since I've been a kid. So when I look out over this group, the way you love your construction industry, you know, that's the passion that, that I have for petrochemicals in the chemical industry. And uh, we've had some, some peaks and valleys. There's been some tough times in this industry. I would tell you that it's, it's a very global industry and it's extremely competitive extremely competitive. And, uh, but there's been a game changer, and, and, and that game changer certainly is shale gas. It, it has changed the, the, really the, the, the global footprint of this industry. See, a lot of our products, um, uh, for, for us, we're, we're competitors of one another, we're suppliers to each other, we're customers of each other, and that, that's true globally. And the construction that we have going on in our particular area is about $30 billion. Some of these are truly world-scale plants. Um, world-scale for us now are, are plants that run somewhere between two and four billion pounds a year. A lot of that is exported. In fact, we sit on the Port of Houston. Um, it's the only port in our country that exports more than it imports. Of course, as a country, we're a, a net importer by, I, I think, about $500 billion. But in our particular port, it, it's, it's, a, it's an export port. It, uh, has a big supply chain connected to it. And uh, you know, it's just, it's just been a game changer. The amount of construction going on in our area and, and what we're looking for in skilled labor is significant. Um, the first of the large projects will come online in the fourth quarter and we've got construction uh, moving forward. So it's, it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time for skilled labor. And you know, it, just, it, it not just drives the economy of Harris County, but it drives the economy of our state and, and significantly to our country. Mm -hmm. Sharon, uh, I know Dow has some pretty exciting projects going on right now as well as far as expansion, huh? Absolutely. So um, I want to acknowledge Kevin Hilton, who educated me a lot about the magnificent work of the iron workers um, by sending me an annual report. Until I had opened that annual report, I really did not have a lot of information on the contribution that the iron workers had made to our Gulf Stream project. And so Dow had committed to spend about $6 billion on the Gulf Coast, uh, taking shale gas and transforming that into propylene, ethylene, so that we could transform that into higher value chemicals along the value chain to make things for end users. And so there were approximately 200 iron workers who were part of this large PDH construction project 
Now, while that's important to me as an Acrylates manufacturing director, the price of propylene is vital to the success of my business. And so by being able to take propane as a feedstock and transform that into propylene, it allows us to compete with our competitors in China who, due to their advantage on feedstocks and low-cost labor, had built their capacity overbuilt by a factor of 3x and were putting extreme pressure on us as manufacturers in the United States. Well, this propane dehydrogenation unit is a game changer for us. And the work and contribution of safely manufacturing uh, that facility so that it could make a product to be used by my organization does what's important to me. And we have common goals. It is about jobs. I'm interested in sustaining and creating new jobs for the people in my organization because that's what drives me. It is really a lot about people and productivity. And it's really interesting. I want to acknowledge just my unbelievable inspiration derived from Dr. Dale Henry's presentation yesterday. I mean, I just walked away thinking, wow, you know, there's, awesome. a, there's a misperception, I think, in the industry sometimes that a, a union worker is the first to say, that's not my job. And so to have someone come to an impact conference and lead off with a keynote on two things that we would never say, or you should never say, that's not my job, and I wish I would have. Those are two things that are core to my leadership philosophy around people and productivity, right? Productivity is about getting the most, and it's really only important because productivity helps protect people. It protects jobs, right? And so if you look at what he said, and the other piece to that is I wish I would have, that speaks volumes about what we've learned in safety. Right, so the intervention that you didn't make is the one that really haunts you. If you see a coworker do something that's just not right. I had something happen to me with my Dow colleagues on a business trip. We were um, very um, senior managers all in a large uh, bus headed back to the airport and we've got rules on training related to seat belt use, et cetera, just like every other organization does. And on the way to the airport in Midland, Michigan, it was a horrible snowstorm, and I was thinking to myself, I'm so thankful I am not driving. So um, then I realized, oh my goodness, I don't have on my seatbelt. And I'm trying to sheepishly try to get it and fasten it. And so after I've secured myself, I start checking everybody else. And I realize no one has on a seatbelt. And I faced kind of that dilemma that I think a lot of workers on the job face is, who am I to intervene with my colleagues around me, right? Five seconds ago, I didn't have my own seatbelt on. And so it was out of ignorance. And so I've got that classic angel and demon on each shoulder, you know, the angel saying, my gosh, you know, what if we get in an accident and you're the only survivor and you have to tell all these people's families that uh, you didn't intervene? And then, you know, the devil saying, you're a hypocrite. You know, you just put yours on. What, you're going to stand up and grandstand like you're the smartest person on the bus. And so, you know, I'm having this battle. And before I can get any reconciliation, we're pulling into the airport. And so that's a missed opportunity, right? And so it's a case where I had to say, I wish I would have. But that doesn't have to define who we are as workers. Every day is a new day. And I'm really inspired by the iron workers' passion to reinvent themselves, to em embrace innovation. And so the next time I boarded a bus with my Dow colleagues and noticed that of the 35 people on the bus, none of them were wearing seatbelts before the driver cranked the ignition, I made a public service announcement because that was my do-over. And any time you have regret when you're faced with a sim similar situation, you get to redefine yourself. And that's, that's key in our industry, I think, to not rest on the mistakes of the past or to laud ourselves on the accomplishments of the past, but to treat each new day as an opportunity so that we are able to embrace it and make the most of it and move forward. Because moving forward is going to be key to being successful in our industry. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, leveraging off that safety talk, what kind of uh, safety requirements do the contractors have and the workers that want to come inside of the gate down in the Gulf Coast? What, what, what requirements do your plants have? Sure. So uh, we have an approved material supplier list. And in order to get on that list, to even have an opportunity for a seat at the table, 
you must have an OSHA incident rate of 2.0 or less. But very similar to minimum expectations when it comes to um, hiring, et cetera, oftentimes while that is the minimum requirement, certainly the higher um, your performance is with regard to not having incidents, if you've got an incident rate that's one or less, then that makes you a more attractive uh, partner for us because we don't want it to enter into a contract with someone on a job, their OSHA incident rate, you know, go in a negative direction where it's three or four and we're having to part ways because of uh, unacceptable injury performance. Jim? Yeah, a, a comment that I would make. <clears throat> I've been a plant manager for 17 years, get a performance pr appraisal every year. The top line on the performance appraisal, probably the same thing for Sharon, is, is safety results. And those aren't just safety results of employees within our company. They're nested maintenance, they're construction maintenance, or turnaround crews. Um, and uh, so, so that's the number one thing. And it's really, if, if I could, it, you know, it's the ante to get in the game. And uh, you know, I've really been impressed with the improvements in safety in the years that I've been in the industry, especially on the construction side. I, I want to talk a little bit about the Houston Area Safety Council. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. We, we formed this group 27 years ago after we had a significant incident at a couple of, of local sites. Um, today, that, uh, that, that group um, last year trained over a million training modules. On an average day, about 1,000 contractors go through the site. We, we put uh, you know, the, 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 the safety priority is definitely number one. Our rules tend to be very uh, consistent. I'd mentioned these hundred and 32 plants, it's 80 different companies. We tend to be very consistent with, uh, with our safety requirements. Um, we, we often see contractors with, uh, with recordable rates less than one. Um, just impressive, impressive results, uh, I believe in behavioral safety, I believe in the statistics. And uh, you know, the most important asset for us is, is definitely the people. You know, we, we can construct the plants, we have the technology, we have the equipment. People are the number one asset in protecting those people. You mentioned a recordable rate, oftentimes less than one. As a guy that just kind of has his ear to the business, it may be two, but one is the number that I hear the most, that uh, if you don't have a one, you probably aren't going to be competitive from a bid standpoint because uh, we're not only competing against price as a contractor market, but we're competing in safety. Yeah, and if I could, you know, just applaud the, the people in the construction business, when we started the Houston Area Safety Council, that number was around seven, mm -hmm. 27 years ago, and now we're talking about ones. We, we would have never thought, we, our goal was to get it below three. So, um, you know, I, I guess that, that tells you about visioning and setting stretch goals and holding people accountable and, and systems mm -hmm. and, and really um, partnering, working together between, between owners and, and construction companies. Do you have, uh, we saw a great presentation earlier today about one of the contractor safety uh, programs. Do you have any ideas what your contractors are doing internally for safety? Do you have specific requirements for them outside of the safety council or is that uh, contractor led? The, the majority of it is contractor led. We have some things, a lot of pre-job uh, hazard assessments that are done. But my personal philosophy is that there is nothing quite as effective as um, management by walking around and really having each person as an ambassador for safety. If everybody on your crew is concerned with safety, the odds of somebody getting hurt on that crew are, are very small because people are very comfortable with intervention. We've got uh, very um, effective staff work authority programs and we um, obviously leverage that out into the craftsman to say, hey, if a job doesn't look right for you, you if you're not comfortable with this permit, do not accept it, because we'll take whatever time is necessary to make sure the job is safe to, to perform. Right. Yeah, very robust safety uh, processes um, that begin with training and go through auditing. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, it's people. And uh, you know, the, in our business, we really do differentiate process safety which would be a different discussion today versus you know, the people behavioral side. And I think you know, management by walking around, it, 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 it is just an important tool along with all the other uh, process sa uh, activities that we have in safety. Are there any other key metrics outside of safety you're really looking for to qualify a contractor to come into your plant? What, what are we looking for in contractors? Sure. So I personally am looking for quality of craftsmanship, right? So if I, if I haven't, 
a weld repair job done in the plant, and then a week later I'm having to bring somebody else in to re-repair something that should have been done with ex excellent craftsmanship the first time. That's certainly something I take into consideration when I'm deciding whether or not to bring that contractor back. So I'm looking at productivity, at quality of craftsmanship, um, the ability to collaborate with other people, to, to work alongside other craftsmen effectively. Those are things that give us a competitive advantage when we can partner with people who are good at that. Yeah, petrochemical plant is a very sophisticated place, right? So, uh, you know, may, maybe this is kind of a three-legged stool. You have to have all three, safety, quality, and cost. But, you know, quality critical, you know, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, how about workforce development? We've seen a lot of stuff here at the IW about right. uh, the great training that they have, and uh, they want to impress to uh, shops that maybe don't use them uh, how competitive they can be in that. What are the contractors in the Gulf Coast doing as far as workforce development and putting those skills together? So we're seeing a lot of uh, apprenticeship programs that are being done really apart from union labor. And I'm not sure why we're duplicating efforts, but that is actually going on. And so Dow has an apprenticeship program for operators as well as for instrument technicians. And so we're doing that with local community colleges because like you, we see a need for workforce development. And so. Um, I have been invited uh, to go attend the uh, local iron workers training facility, and I do intend to do that to get a feel for what's going on there. But I, I would be remiss to not tell you your best form of advertising is word of mouth for jobs well done, right? And so me hearing about what happened on the PDH project and then learning that a lot of the contractors that I deal with routinely on large scale turnarounds are in fact iron workers. Right, so they don't, they don't really wear it as a badge, it's kind of understated, but the quality of their work has been phenomenal. And so I would go back to them, and that's really gonna be the differentiator, is do you have a value proposition for my organization that makes you a strategic choice to partner with? Because you're gonna bring quality craftsmanship, you're gonna bring excellent productivity, you're gonna get the job done without incident. And if you're doing that, and also have excellent training facilities, you're gonna be my choice every time. The workforce development is critical. In fact, I look over at Hector, our CEO for Texas Chemical Council. How are you doing, Hector? <laughs> All right. You know, we, we have a, a committee focused on workforce, and, and, and to be honest with you, we're a little bit behind. What happened in, we all remember 2009, it was a tough time, right? You know, we really didn't know where this industry was going and manufacturing, you know, in general across the United States. And, you know, so many of our high school vocational programs have been cut for different reasons, right? Maybe the cost of that and, 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 and other reasons. What we, what we started to do uh, as we came out of 2009, we got our plant manager group together and, and we started working on workforce. Uh, we met with over 200,000 students in the greater Houston area. Mm -hmm. uh, we got into uh, intermediate schools and high schools. Uh, we developed a speaking team, um, um, had over 80 engagements. Um, hooked up with the uh, community colleges, started building programs with the community colleges, and uh, you know, really to, to, to build that craftsman rank up so that we can build these kind of uh, facilities that we're talking about in the future. And appreciate these facilities. For every employee that we have within our plant, there are seven indirect jobs. So that's kind of the ratio um, in, our, in our business. You know, last night at dinner, I had an opportunity to visit with uh, one of the executives from uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and it was super interesting to me. He's been a uh, proud union uh, uh, owner for, I think he said, 40 years, and uh, he was telling me how the owners in their environment, they all kick into the union training uh, fiscally, which, and uh, they're very proud of that, and there's even some good peer pressure it reminded me of NATO, you know, you got to make everybody pay their fair share. Uh, and I think about the Gulf Coast and how the plants all kick in to the community colleges down there. We've got a big, big project going on with Brenda uh, and uh, San Jacinto. You want to tell a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, absolutely. So, uh, so our local community college, San Jacinto Community College, sixth largest in the state of Texas, um, we, we just passed a $400 million bond, and the reason why that's significant in our particular area, 51% of the taxes that go to the community college comes from industry. So let me say that again. The, 
the, the majority of the taxes doesn't come from the residents, it comes from the operators. So the first thing that that chancellor did was, was met with this group of plant managers and said, can I, can I get your support? Mm -hmm. And I was in that meeting, blessed to be in that meeting, six plant managers. And, and I was going to show a little deference, so I looked over at my colleagues and every head was going up and down. The decision took about five seconds. So, um, uh, so in that project, there's a $55 million build of the $400 million to uh, train craftsmen in, in pro what we call PTEX, process tax. And, and it's cool. I mean, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a pilot plant. It's a distillation column. It's a distributed control system. It's a control room. Um, the the, um, the, the uh, students come in and they cart in and they sign permits and they operate through the facility. And uh, the very first day they meet with the plant manager. And that plant manager talks to them about what it takes to be a craftsperson in our industry or an operator in, in our industry. Talks about reliability and shift work and what it's like to run a 24-7 operation that's worth billions of dollars. So, you know, I think that kind of partnership, uh, that community partnership is, uh, is critical and, and, uh, and it's very rewarding, obviously, to, to have that time with, with the educators and, and with the students. Uh, moving on from workforce development, um, let's talk about uh, <clears throat> some of the contractor relationships and contracting strategy and winning work. Uh, one of the questions uh, that came up a couple times uh, recently, uh, do we, are we more often uh, hard bidding work or are we bidding time and materials or, and if so, why? What, what's the contracting philosophy in the Gulf Coast for this type of work? Sure, so, so we do a little bit of both. Um, I have a personal preference. I, I love hard bid contracts because they help me plan my budget much more effectively and I can rely on a, a quality uh, partner, construction partner, to manage productivity. And you know, the, the negative that people always tell you with hard money bids is maybe people get in too big a hurry and they won't manage safety. I submit to you that nobody can manage safety like the Dow Chemical Company came <laughs> ingrained in our DNA. So we got a bunch of disciples who are out there in the field willing and interested in managing safety. What I don't know how to do is I'm not a welder. I don't know how long a pipe fitting job ought to take. And so I'm really wanting to rely on that contract leader to know what type of man hours should be involved and to drive the productivity piece. And so we partner on that. Obviously, if there's discovery and what you bid on morphs into something larger than what the agreement was, we're going to do a field change order and compensate people fairly. But I love the hard money bid just because it lets me predict my budget much more effectively. And I am held accountable to a budget at the end of the year. And it, it, it seems to get reduced consistently. That's the one thing I can count on is that they do not give me more money. Yeah, over the course of my career, I would also uh, say the majority were hard bids. Uh, but but <laughs> T&M work is, is critical, a absolutely. When, when do we use T&M work? Well, when we have a little bit of problem defining the scope, we, we're not quite sure what we're gonna get into. What I would tell you about T&M is you have to have a really good relationship and a lot of trust between the owner and, and, and the construction company. I think one of the advantages um, that we have in our geography is that uh, we've been there a long time. And uh, most of these companies have been, there's, there's, a, there's a relationship that's been there and, uh, and a trust and a respect. Uh, you know, it, it does require a lot, of, a lot of communication, obviously. And uh, especially when we're doing something time critical, some of our turnarounds um, are hundreds of millions of dollars and they're very time sensitive. So we'll do daily reviews on those, a little bit different maybe than a construction project where you know, we're doing a weekly review. It's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, you know, a different time sensitive nature, but uh, yeah, we use both models. Um, again, regarding contracting, you both work for uh, international companies with a lot of facilities. Um, would a contractor typically uh, go to procure a contract on a site-by-site -site basis with you, or do they have to go to corporate? It, it actually is done both ways in Dow. So I was a, a former small site leader where I had authority to add people onto the approved material supplier list, and that can still be done. You work through local purchasing agents, so if there's a, a local contractor in the Houston area, that can be facilitated through our local offices, provided you've got the reputation, the safety, um, 
you know, performance that we would require for you to be competitive, and then you would have the opportunity to come in and bid on work. Yep, yep. same. Um, what aspects of the contractor owner relationship have worked particularly well in your plant, and what challenges have you seen with contractors? And so I would say the things that work really well is when we partner on things like safety, right? When people are forthright with information and don't try to hide incidents, um, that there's one sure way to kind of get you uninvited to a Dow facility, and that's to try to cover up an accident. And so we prefer just to deal with what really happened um, and we really applaud when craftsmen escalate concerns to us near misses so that we can learn from them because really it's a failure on a variety of fronts for something to have led to that. Obviously, we did not uh, plan the work out effectively or communicate something, but if something's covered up, then we miss the learning. And if we're really, as an organization, collectively going to drive to a real zero, we're going to have to get real about what's really going on because luck can't be a factor. And when we have these near misses that go unreported, we're relying too much on luck and the things that set in motion that near miss will probably occur later again and become a direct hit where somebody leaves in an ambulance or, or worse yet, maybe even in a hearse. And so we love the partnering with really transparency and uh, where we get a little bit disillusioned is when we see people really trying to present things that aren't accurate. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, two or three things I would add to that is it begins at the very beginning with, with the potential contractors. You know, in that pre-bid scope meeting, that open, honest discussion about what the project is and what the project isn't, I, I think that's just a critical part of the process. And, and then um, the, the daily walkthroughs that, that you have with the, with, the con, with the contractor and the clear accountability, especially in these bigger projects, of, of uh, the roles and responsibilities of the contractor through the project and you know those those adjustments that occur you know quite, quite frequently because the the project has some has some scope change or has some some issues uh, some staffing issues as an example you know some of our projects that we're seeing on the Gulf Coast are behind in schedule and they were initially designed to to run you know four tens and then what happens is we go to five tens and then a six day week and sometimes you know we've got one project that's active that's you know, on a seven day schedule and, and that makes it difficult. It makes it difficult on the staffing side and that's where communication is, is really important. You, the trend that I hear is that more and more of the owners are going to a smaller and smaller pool of contractors. They want somebody that can be multidisciplined and can provide a, a broader array of services. I've seen in the contractor community a lot of mergers because of this. Do you, uh, is, has that been the case in the facilities that you've run, the companies you work for? And if so, uh, you know, how does one pierce the veil to become one of the select contractors that, if we're using fewer and fewer, we've got a lot of contractors here in the room that potentially would like an opportunity to work? Sure. Any advice? And that's a tough question, I recognize it. So I would say um, I do see some movement toward consolidation, but at the same speed I see that happening, I see us bringing in new people because we're displeased with some, some current service we're getting from some contractors or we feel like maybe we're not getting a fair price because they ventured into a situation that tends to be more of a monopoly. And when we assess what, what value we're getting from the service being provided, we question whether or not we're paying an unfair markup. And so we'll invite in an alternate supplier just to make sure that we're not being taken advantage of. And so um, I, I really think there's a place for both. Mm -hmm. um, consolidation where it makes sense, where you do have that trust you talked right. about, where there's a very good transparency between the organizations. We agree on how much money we're both gonna make off this and be very um, honest with that. You know, we, we're not in business to try to put people out of business that are partnering with us. We realize that the people that work with us have to make money, but so do we. Yeah. And so um, really when we have those successful partnerships, uh, we see larger conglomerations. Mm -hmm. And when those relationships are not working well, we see more competition coming in the door that, that frankly we've invited in. Right, right. You know, I, I agree. Um, you know, we want all of our suppliers to be successful. You know, we just, 
don't want them to go to Florida on us. You know, that's <laughs> kind of the deal. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, sometimes bigger is better on some of the bit larger projects. But, uh, you know, uh, our plants look at uh, multiple vendors and multiple contractors. And, and we, you know, we feel that we can, you know, adequately bring in people that bring in, you know, additional value um, to the project. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, um, Last year was the first year that I had an opportunity to come to an iron workers conference and being from more of an open shop background It really opened my eyes and I know uh, my, my friends here have had their eyes opened and You do have a challenge as iron workers really to uh, educate other areas that haven't used you in the past But it's a challenge that can be overcome and I, I want to use a, uh, a metaphor when I was a senior at LSU, I had some uh, Spanish students that I uh, became very good friends with. And the first time I ever traveled internationally was sometimes after college. I went to go see my friend Arturo in Madrid. And I was like, man, this is weird. You know, everything, everything in Madrid was weird to me. And he, in his wisdom, told me, you know, it's not weird, Thomas, it's just different. And, uh, and that's what I've come to realize about the iron workers. It's not weird, it's just different. <laughs> and I hope that you would realize the same about the Gulf Coast and the chemical industry. It's not weird, we're just maybe a little different than you. But at the same time, it is a global community now. And I'm gonna be interfacing with people in Spain and you're gonna be interfacing with people in the Gulf Coast. And the pie is very, very big. And I think with our workforce needs that there's gonna be plenty of opportunity for you. And we hope to see you down in the Gulf Coast sometime soon. Thank you. Nice.